and they threw him overboard. And I'm asking, that when they threw him overboard, was he dead or was he alive? But before you answer, I want an answer from you all. But before you answer, I want you to realize that the man had volunteered. He said, throw me. So when a man volunteers, you don't have to strangle him before throwing. You don't have to spear him before throwing. You don't have to break his arm or limb before throwing. The man volunteers to throw me. So when they threw him overboard, was he dead or was he alive? I want an answer from you all. Was he dead or was he alive? Alive. That's the right answer. You get no price for that. It was very simple. Very easy. You didn't have to use your, 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 your brain, your wheel, you know, to find out what was involved. The storm subsides. Perhaps it was a coincidence. A fish comes and gobbles in. Dead or alive? Alive. From the fish's belly, stomach, he prays to God for help. I'm asking, do dead people pray? Do dead people pray? No. So was he dead or was he alive? Alive. Three days and three nights, the fish takes him around the ocean. And on the third day, vomits him alive. So he was alive, 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 alive. When they threw him into the sea, he was alive. The fish, you see, the man ought to die. If he dies, it's not a miracle. Because we expect a man to die in a raging sea. A fish comes and gobbles a man. The fish is not a respecter of a person. It's a, you know, Jonah, come, come. Oh, you are a prophet of God, come. Mm, come, come, come. Is that what the fish does? Is that how fish behave? Huh? It just break you up into pieces in two ticks. Kill the man, straight away. He's not respected. Oh, he's a prophet of God. You know, let me treat him gently. <laughs> come, 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 Jonah. Come. The fish is a fish. The man ought to die. Three days and three nights, suffocation and heat in the whale's belly. The man ought to die. If he died, it's not a miracle. If he died, it's not a miracle. When the two men the sea, if he died, not a miracle. Fish gobbles a man, if he died, it's not a miracle. Three days and three nights, suffocation and heat in the whale's belly. If he died, it's not a miracle. So this is the miracle of miracle. The most outstanding miracle in the Bible. Three times over. Over. Impossibility upon impossibility upon impossibility. A miracle is an impossibility. And this is an impossibility three times over. So Jesus says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Just like Jonah. What happened to Jonah is going to happen to me. And, and I'm asking my Christian brother, as I do my brother Wakefield, that in your language, sir, this English I'm speaking is a foreign language that the reverend discovered, bishop discovered, say I'm a man from the Bombay province in India and I speak Gujarati, he knows all that. English is a foreign language to me. Now it is your mother tongue. And those of you who speak English as a mother tongue, I'm asking you all, in your language, I'm asking that Jesus, Jesus, in the tomb, after his alleged crucifixion, was he dead or was he alive? The Christian says, the Christian says he was dead. He was dead for three days and three nights. You ask any Christian, Jesus was dead. Jonah is alive for three days and three nights. I'm asking in your language, is that like Jonah or unlike Jonah? In your language, Jesus is dead, Jonah is alive. Is that like Jonah or unlike Jonah? Huh? Unlike. It's unlike. They're unlike. One is dead, one is alive. Three days and three nights, three days and three nights. So I said, and Jesus said, I'll be like Jonah. Hakaza, just like that. In Afrikaans, someone, suas Jonah. Suas Jonah, just like Jonah. In the Zulu, say, ngoba, jengo chona. Just like Jonah. In every language of the world, it is so explicit, it is so clear that he will be like Jonah and the whole Christian world says that he was not like Jonah. So I'm asking, 
Who is not speaking the truth? Jesus or you? Your Lord says he'll be like Jonah and you telling me that he was not like Jonah. Was he lying? Was he lying? I can't believe that he was lying. A mighty messenger of God, a prophet of God. You say he's a son of God. I said, right, okay. Was he lying to the people? What's the answer? He said, no, you can't be lying. Maybe you got it all wrong. The Christian world, you have got it all wrong. Because he's not like Jonah. And he said he'll be like Jonah. And it's a miracle of a miracle of a miracle that the man, when you expect him to be dead, he's alive. This, what I discussed with you just now, is available in this little pamphlet form. What was the sign of Jonah? And I understand it's being sold outside. I don't know for how much, I don't know. These are 12 small pages, 12 pages, 12 pages. And if you master this, 12 pages, this argument that I gave to you just now, from this little booklet, as a reminder, there isn't a Christian born who can argue and debate with you about the death and resurrection of Jesus. Just this book alone. This is dynamite. This is the laser gun of the intellect. You talk, you reason, you say, come and tell me now, was Jesus like Jonah? He said he will be like Jonah, and the whole Christian world says he's unlike Jonah. What does that prove? That the man was not a true messenger of God. He was not a true prophet of God. He was an imposter. That's what it implies. The man was lying. He was bluffing. I said, no, Jesus didn't bluff. He doesn't bluff. We believe that he was a mighty messenger of God, and whatever he said, he spoke the truth. Now, after the alleged crucifixion, Sunday morning, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, one of his disciples, lady disciples. What did she go there for? Why did she go to the tomb? So John chapter 20 verse 1, he tells us that she went to anoint him three days after the crucifixion, the alleged crucifixion. She goes to anoint him. The Hebrew word for anoint is masaha. Masaha means to rub, to massage, to anoint. The Arabic word is masif, from the word masaha. The Hebrew word is messiah, from the word masaha, means to rub, to massage, to anoint. So I'm asking whether the Jews massage dead bodies after three days, do they? She went to anoint him. That's what the word says. In Hebrew is masaha. She went to do masaha. Said, so do Jews massage dead bodies after three days? You know, within three hours, rigor mortis sets in. The hardening of the cells, the decomposition starts taking place. In three days' time, the body is fermenting from inside. Such a fermenting body, you go and massage it, fall to pieces. Does it make sense? That she would go and massage a dead, rotting body, give a massage? Huh? We Muslims, we are the closest to the Jew. Do we massage dead bodies after three days? Do we? No. And I'm asking the Christians, whether you Christian massage dead bodies after three days. Do you? Do the Christian, any Christian, any Christian here, I don't know. I said, whether Christians massage dead bodies after three days, do they? The Christian, do they massage dead bodies after three days? Do they? Dead body, rotten body, do they go and massage it? With olive oil or anything else? No. <laughs> So Mary Magdalene, the Bible says she went to anoint him. I'm only using the internal evidence of the Bible. I'm not going outside, my cleverness. Or this philosopher said this and that, scientist said that, nothing of the kind. I'm only using the internal evidence of the Bible. The evidence derived from the words themselves. Nothing from the outside, no cleverness here. I'm only reading to you in the authorized King James Version, what is called the King's English or the Queen's English, simple, basic language. <laughs> so, she wants to massage, anoint Jesus. And she's worried that who, the stone, she had seen a stone being put in the mouth of the sepulchre, the tomb. It was not a grave, it was not a grave. It was a tomb carved out of a rock. According to Jim Bishop, a Christian learned man, he says the size of the tomb was five feet wide by seven feet high by 15 feet deep with a ledge or ledges inside. Jim Bishop, that's what he said. Five feet wide, seven feet high, 15 feet deep with a ledge or ledges inside. 
So she's worried now, she said, look, there was a stone put on, who's going to remove the stone? Because she's a lady, frail woman. But when she reaches the tomb, she's pleasantly surprised that the stone is already removed. The stone is already removed. I will answer your question, sir. The stone is already removed. She peeps inside. And she sees the winding sheets inside. And she starts to cry. It's an anti-climax, anti-climax to what she had expected. She expected to find Jesus there. But instead she finds that only sheets, the man is missing. So she starts to cry. Jesus was watching her from wherever he was. Not from heaven, but from this earth. This tomb was a privately owned property belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, a very rich influential disciple of Jesus. Who could afford to carve out a rock, a big roomy chamber? Around this tomb was his vegetable garden, and perhaps his gardener's quarters, and his country home, where he went during the weekends for holiday. Jesus is there, he's watching this woman, and he comes up to her, and he says, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? What are you crying for? Who are you looking for? The Bible says, She's supposing him to be the gardener. I'm asking, why does she, she suppose he's a gardener? Do resurrected bodies look like gardeners? Do they? I said, because he's disguised as a gardener. Why is he disguised as a gardener? I said, because he's afraid of the Jews. Why is he afraid of the Jews? Because he didn't die and he didn't conquer death. If he had died and if he had conquered death, there's no need to be afraid anymore. Why not? 